uh, welcome everyone to the afternoon session. I hope you had a good lunch and good, good chats. Um, we are delighted to be opening the EDPS Civil Society Summit. Um, so I just wanted to say a few words of intro and then I'll leave on to my colleague Ella for introducing the panel. But thank you so much to, to Wojciech Wejworowski and his team for the continuation of this tradition of exchange with civil society. Um, it's really important to have continued dialogue between EU institutions and NGOs um, and really con continuing connecting on issues of common concern. So thank you so much. Thank you for the financial support as well, as I, I said in the opening, but saying it that again. Um, just wanted to thank specifically uh, my colleague Ella Jakubowska and the team at the EDPS, especially Kazik uh, Uzadowski, for preparing this particular session this year. Um, this year is a special year for the EDPS. We wanted to say once again, happy anniversary. Um, and when discussing, you know, this, this, this uh, year editions of the summit, um, it was really clear that there was uh, an appetite to talk about the big picture. Uh, we are closing this mandate of the European uh, Commission and Parliament, and many um, laws have been discussed and adopted the GSA, the AI Act, as we discussed this morning, but also still encountering a lot of GDPR enforcement issues. So it really felt important to discuss like enforcement of these rules um, and what is the role of, of um, watchdogs, whether it's civil society or more official supervisors, in enforcement of these rules, and especially in the context of backsliding of democracy in Europe and in the world. So um, I leave uh, Ella introducing the panelists, and I wish you a pleasant session. Thank you so much, Claire. So as Claire said, welcome to this session, Bark and Bite, where we're going to focus on lots of different parts of inf the enforcement ecosystem in the EU. First of all, I'm delighted to give the floor to Wojciech Wierowski, the EDPS, uh, to talk about the enforcement of data protection as a means to protect and promote human rights. So if you could please kick us off. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the possibility to be here. Uh, as you know, uh, already for some years, uh, we try to organize the meeting with the civic society uh, on the um, edge of the uh, privacy camp uh, as the event. Uh, we don't uh, invade the whole privacy camp. Uh, we just use it as an opportunity to talk with those uh, who are our eyes on the world. Uh, theoretically, the watchdogs uh, which the regulators are are always focused uh, on the tip of the iceberg, uh, which are the, play, uh, the things that the people are complaining about. But uh, we have to remember that the European Data Protection Supervisor is not only the one who is dealing with the complaints, uh, but is also the advisor in the legislative process uh, in the European Union. So while in our supervisory role, we are focused on the public sphere, in our advisory role, we are dealing with the whole data uh, protection law and the whole privacy law, actually, uh, in the European Union. So then we need an eyes on what's going on around. And I was always of the opinion that the big part of this job is done by the civic society movement, not only by the NGOs, but also by individual activists because these are the ones who have the knowledge which we do not have, and they are observing the world, observing from the point of view of those who are dealing with the human rights. Uh, data protection is not the human right in uh, the strictest sense of this word. Uh, of course, the privacy appears in the human rights uh, uh, um, documents, uh, and it appears uh, in the declarations and in the fundamental rights uh, uh, of the, uh, in the fundamental rights of the European Union. But data protection is a little bit different animal. And sometimes it's, off, it's even put it as the um, counterbalance to some human rights uh, and uh, to the part of the story which we call the citizens' rights. That especially goes uh, to the problem of the right to speech, 
the problem of transparency versus sometimes uh, badly understood uh, data protection. I also remember always uh, the kind of course that was uh, said by Serge Guthrith uh, from the uh, Free University of Brussels, uh, VUB, who said that it was easier to deal with the privacy and to defend the privacy before the data protection law had been created. Because the data protection law is often the list of mitigation measures uh, which allow to in uh, intrude the privacy. Of course, that's not uh, what I would agree with, but I have to admit that we are often asked to be like that, to be this kind of uh, institution, the institution who will say what is the threshold that you cannot uh, uh, go over. And then the problem of the work of the regulators like the data protection authorities are, is that we have to, at one f point, enforce the law which exists, on the other hand, we have to think uh, what we should have in the next step in the future. When I saw the uh, title of today's session, I thought it is interesting. Uh, let's say, from the PR point of view, well written. But it's not necessarily what I would like to do as a data protection authority. I have a dog. I really appreciate the fact that he thinks that he defends my house. But that's Bichon Fries. He's not the one whom you uh, send against the enemies, but you rather will use him as a pillow. So I don't want to be the one who barks only for barking, and I don't want to be one who is uh, uh, accountable by biting. So it's not necessarily the most important thing for me. What are the fines and what are the big cases? But I see the problem of the enforcement of the GDPR, but also European Union DPR, the, the regulation which deals with the data protection in the EU institutions. I see the problem of solving the problems for the future and getting the complainant uh, be happy of the way that we dealt with his case. And that it seems to be the bigger and bigger gap in between the expectation of those uh, whose data was uh, misused or leaked or breached and those uh, who try to solve the problem for the future. And I hope that I will hear today the good uh, examples and the constructive criticism towards the situation that we have at the moment, because I believe that from 2025, we'll have again the discussion on what the data protection law means and what the privacy means in 21st century. So Ella, back to you, and I hope that this panel will stay in your memory. Thank you so much for that brilliant opening. Um, it really sets an interesting <laughs> a tone for the discussion. Um, so we're going to start now with a bit of a quick fire round just to introduce the panelists and give you all a bit of insight into who we've got sharing the expertise with us today. So first of all, I'm going to bring us to Thomas Zerdick. Um, I tried to do the German pronunciation beforehand and it was useless, so we decided to go for an anglicized pronunciation, I'm sorry. Thomas is the head of supervision and enforcement at the EDPS, so incredibly relevant for the content of this panel. And before joining the EDPS, Thomas worked on the EU's landmark data protection laws, the GDPR, Law Enforcement Directive, at the European Commission. So he also has a perspective from the other side of enforcement. So Thomas, without further ado, one of the themes of this year's privacy camp is revealing systems. What systems will you be working to reveal in 2024? Thank you, Ella. Um, well, obviously, the first thing which comes to mind is what um, my supervisor has already alluded to, um, the 20th anniversary of uh, the EDPS as an institution, as a supervisory authority. Um, but you've probably heard already a lot about that, so I'm not going to go into this. 
What I can reveal, Ella, is certainly this year will be interesting from a supervision and enforcement perspective because we will finalize our investigation into the European Commission's use of uh, Microsoft 365. As you know, that is an um, already uh, longer investigation from our side, but it is uh, critically important because it will um, look at the overall compliance um, by the Commission in this case, um, but also at the players in the processing chain, and uh, we will look at contractual arrangements and obviously also at transfers. And that will be um, of, in of importance for all the other 77 EU institutions, offices, bodies and agencies uh, when they use that product. Um, but also, Ella, I think important is, you remember, the EDPS has uh, started a court action against the European Parliament and the Council as regards true provisions in the latest Europol regulation um, because of their retroactive effect. We are uh, in the procedure of appealing against the first decision by the General Court and that will also be of importance, I think, to the EDPS as an institution and also as a signage to the legislators on what should be done with privacy legislation and not. So, first thoughts from me. Thank you. Great, thank you, and fantastic to hear of those really concrete things that will be coming up. So, I'm going to ask a similar question now to our next speaker, Simona de Heer, who is a digital advisor to the Dutch delegation of the Greens Group in the European Parliament. Uh, one of the MEPs whom she advises is Tineke Strick, uh, rapporteur for the Frontex Scrutiny Group, um, who unfortunately has not been able to join us today. Uh, but Simona also follows this work closely, and so we're delighted to have Simona in her place. Um, so, Simona, I mentioned the Frontex Scrutiny Group. Um, you spent the last year working with MEPs to reveal systems as part of that. What has been your biggest takeaway from this piece of work? Yes, uh, sorry you'll have to do with me today because ironically, Tsinenka had to be in the Frontex Scrutiny Group meeting that was last minute planned at this moment. Um, it's a good I reason. It's a good reason. Today is also about revealing systems. So um, I wouldn't want to claim any of the great work that Tsinenka's migration, my migration colleagues have done on uh, the scrutiny group and on scrutiny on Frontex. I mainly cover her digital policies. But uh, I think in the current systems we are in and the current trends we see, a lot of people are feeling scared, especially when you hear the migration narratives. We see uh, increasingly we have uh, political games that are no longer about content, scapegoating many groups of people, but especially migrants. Um, you see the debates in the parliament aren't necessarily about constructive solutions anymore, but more about pointing fingers towards each other and sowing fear and division. And in this whole context, the whole topic of migration can really look quite bleak and grim. But I come with a message of hope. I <laughs> asked Tunica what her main takeaways are, and she actually said, her main takeaway of the past term is that however bleak the outlook looks, it actually works to have democratic accountability. If you have civil society constantly documenting what is happening, sounding the alarm bells, investigative journalists doing great work and tirelessly reporting about things going on on the ground, if there's enough of a movement, uh, then still, even in this current political context, you can get a whole report through about uh, fruit scrutiny uh, on Frontex. You have an OLAF investigation into Frontex at the moment. Uh, there was an Ombudsman investigation into Frontex. And in the end, there was even leadership change, if we're speaking about systems. A lot of the time, systems are also influenced by what comes from above. And uh, I think this is a message that even we in some darker times really try to hold on to that this scrutiny, the constant transparency and the communal fight together is never lost and actually leads to improvements. Thank you, Simona. And it's great to have something positive. Um, perhaps others here have seen the kind of re 
emergence of predictions of the, the swing to the right and the far right for the parliament next term. So I think it's really important in that context that we know that our mobilizations work, that complaints work, that there is a reason for why we're doing what we're doing. So another theme of this year's privacy camp is rethinking systems. Um, and I was going to ask this question to my colleague, Chloe Bethelemy, um, but she's unfortunately not been available anymore. So I'm going to use my moderator privilege just to make sure that Edry's perspective is still put across on this topic. Um, and I think similarly to Simona, um, we're seeing in the broader context of the criminalization of migration at the EU's borders. Um, something that we really want to see rethought this year is the punitive, racist, criminal justice and border systems that only seem to get more and more bolstered in EU laws and policies. We've seen that really deeply in our work in the last year and, and before that on AI, on law enforcement, on interoperability. And we also would really like, you know, speaking to Chloe and preparing for this, um, both of us work on some of the law enforcement files. We both see a really strong need to counter this narrative that the EU needs a free flow of data because that's what criminals have. And somehow if we can just open everything up and transcend borders with data, that's going to solve our problems because it really feeds into these narratives of criminalization, of punishment, of a lack of solidarity. And instead, we really want to see the reframing towards the socioeconomic conditions that actually create these conditions. Next, I'm going to go quite predictably um, onto the final privacy camp theme for this year of changing systems. And I'm going to be asking that to Ursula Packel, who I'm delighted to introduce next. Ursula is the Deputy Director General of Bayek, which is the European Consumer Organization. Ursula is a lawyer and a long-running consumer and digital rights advocate. Of course, we know those two rights are, are mutually reinforcing. Um, and she's been a watchdog of those rights since 1997 with Bayek. Um, so, Without further ado, delighted to have you here. Which systems will you and Bayek be hoping to change in 2024? Uh, thank you, Ella, and, and uh, thank you for having me at this, um, at this summit. Um, there, I mean, it's a great question, but it's also a huge question. So I'll start with maybe four short points that I thought about. And the first one, um, and because uh, we have the EDPS, we have Wojciech on the panel, and the EDPS has always, I think, been a very foresightful in the sense of anticipating developments, and, and I think that's extremely important. I would like to uh, mention that in 2018 already there was a piece of consumer legislation called the New Deal, uh, and the EDPS gave an opinion, and in that opinion it underlined that uh, in relation to the data economy, to business practices directed to consumers, to citizens, that it will be very important to look at different aspects of legislation to consumer law, to data protection law, to competition law. And I think this is really the challenge that is really important to seize this year with all the new uh, legislation coming into application, being implemented by the member states, that we challenge our own thinking, change our own system of thinking and go out of silo and look at these things, not only from a GDPR approach, of course, which is still the backbone, let me see, let me say of all the other um, elements and rights that we have, but we need to really um, mobilize all our forces and use all the opportunities, and I hope we come back to opportunities later on as well, to, um, to fight what we uh, want to fight for. Um, the second point, and that's very much related, so we as BIOC, we are going to continue our enforcement activities. We have different strands there. Uh, we did um, just uh, a few weeks ago a consumer uh, complaint against Meta's pay or consent model. I think it's extremely important to really go after these business models uh, of surveillance um, um, that we still have there despite all the efforts. I mean, NOIB has done uh, an excellent uh, work already on that, and we try to complement that also with the consumer approach. We'll maybe go further into the GDPR, but I mean, this is just one example. Um, and then I think 2024 will be also the year to change the enforcement landscape. There are several, 
several elements. One is uh, collective redress, so class action, if you want. We have a directive that is applicable already since more than a year, but the member states are lagging behind. But you will maybe know that GDPR is one of the fields in which in the future consumer organizations, public authorities, other digital rights organizations, whoever who will be qualified entity can take action for injunctions to stop act uh, activities or to ask for compensation. And this could be a game changer, but we need to make it happen. And it's, it's quite a challenge. Um, we also have the DMA, the designation of gatekeepers. We have the DSA, the de designation of very large uh, online platforms, etc. We have I mean, we try to help the Commission uh, in, in uh, lawsuits that are pending against, um, against designations, and we have the AI Act. With, we have to, I think, explore the enforcement system. Uh, and the last point, maybe we also want to change uh, concepts in law. For example, in consumer law, we have this idea that the consumer is the weaker party, uh, and we say we want to look at that from a new perspective, namely of the perspective of digital asymmetry. And that means that in the digital environment, consumers are permanently in a weaker position uh, and we need a different threshold for measuring fairness of um, practices of businesses. So these are just a few elements of the systems I think that we want to change in 24. Thank you. And it's great to hear that there's, there's so many opportunities then. Um, and I think that particularly highlights as well the power of bringing together the different perspectives, the different fields, the different enforcement mechanisms. So we've already heard a short bit from a civil society perspective, supervisory and parliament. Um, so now I'm going to shift a little and last but by no means least, introduce our final panelist, Danny Mekic. Danny is a technologist and researcher with Leiden University and the Eindhoven U University of Technology. Thanks to his work to reveal toxic systems and even the, the, the toxic business models that you have just noted, um, and, th and thanks to that work from, from Danny, we are aware of one of, for me at least, one of the biggest stories that came out of, of last year, um, which is the potentially unlawful targeting of paid adverts on X, formerly Twitter, using protected characteristics, so sensitive characteristics that, that should benefit from really high protections by the European Commission's Home Affairs Unit. Um, a story which is, or a scandal, should I say, which is now under EDPS investigation. Um, so Danny, shifting gear a little bit, could you give us an overview of your watchdog role in this scandal? Um, <clears throat> first of all, thank you for having me here today. Um, actually, I was hoping that I would be never called a watchdog because uh, to some extent that's something, you know, you would like to live in a society that's not necessary to have so much watchdogs. But actually for my doctoral research, I'm super interested in large-scale privacy infringements that are, you know, coming to our society more often. Um, interesting is that we still see them from an infringement perspective. So we look at... Is it proportional? Is it foreseeable? And at the same time, we create a society in, in which the essence of privacy and also data protection is, is uh, under uh, attack, I would say. And obviously, I was also interested in the plans of the uh, EU Commission on introducing another uh, measure of mass surveillance, uh, which is turning uh, all of our digital communications into potential mass surveillance mechanisms um, um, and um, create a technological capability of, of these uh, service providers to um, have real-time scanning of our conversations to see whether or not we, of course, as far as the algorithm thinks, uh, are doing something that is illegal. Um, and interesting enough, while I was researching that, I started seeing advertisements on X, formerly Twitter, which I first didn't really recognize as EU official ads because they were super eerie. They were black and white. Uh, there was this strange music, uh, pictures of children. And this, is, this was this typical type of scammy advertisement trying to sell something to you, stating that the majority of the European population would propose this proposal. I'm not sure who studied it, but it's 180 pages long. I don't even know how you can meaningfully uh, ask people if they consent to something like that in a poll. 
um, and I started researching it, I found that that poll was, I mean, by design flawed because it was only showing the, I would say, potential but unproven positive effects of such mass surveillance but not informing people about the potential consequences. Uh, and then they were simply asking you, are you for the protection of children or for privacy? Well, I don't know. I mean, I believe a lot of us are really in favor of privacy, but I obviously would also choose for the protection of children. Now, that's not, it's not, it's not fair to, to put it as a trade-off. Uh, privacy is a fundamental right also of children, and I think that this type of mass surveillance deserves a more meaningful discussion and conversation. Uh, sadly enough, when it was discussed by a previous seminar organized by the EDPS, I've heard that the commissioner was invited, but didn't want to attend that very interesting meeting around this topic. Now to go back to the advertisement, because of the DSA, um, large uh, platforms like Twitter should have transparency about the targeting mechanisms. And two interesting things I found. The first is that this advertisement was, the, the campaign started one day after the EU Council had a discussion about this proposal and was only targeted on the countries that did not want to vote in favor of this regulation. Um, the second thing that I found is that while it was using, um, I would say, shady tactics that remind me of Cambridge Analytica, uh, of things that we've seen in, in the Trump campaign, um, they were also targeting a specific group of people in our society that were potentially more favorable uh, to this type of uh, proposal by excluding Eurosceptical people, people that uh, are affiliated or interested in some German political parties, even Christianity was excluded. And by doing that, you're sorting out a part of a society and you're creating an insincere conversation, which I believe is not part of a healthy dem democracy. Um, so that's what I found. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be here um, and I hope we will never see something like that again in our democratical society. Thank you, Danny. And um, I have to admit, I'm the one that put this, uh, the dog analogies throughout the, this session. So note to self, maybe not everyone is as obsessed with dogs as I am. Um, but now that we are all warmed up, we're going to move on to a second round where we're going to collectively explore the role of privacy and data protection in upholding rights and democracy in times of backsliding. Um, and in the work that we've been doing as EDRI, we've very much seen in, the, in recent years the politicization and the instrumentalization of many laws and policies. Um, and to give one example, um, my colleagues who follow the Eurodac regulation, um, where we've seen the age for which biometric data can be collected from children on the move, so migrant children, um, down to the age of six, with the claim that it's for their own good, that it's going to help them. Um, and as someone who has worked on the protection of biometric data, so data about our faces, our bodies, um, for many years, we know how sensitive and vulnerable those data are. And so we would automatically question the premise that you know, we're doing this for children's good, um, as well as how it can normalize the, collect the mass collection of people's data. So getting into the, the discussion, I'm going to turn first to Ursula uh, to ask how you think that civil society and other watchdog type entities can help to shine a light on issues regarding the adoption and the implementation of EU policies in politically sensitive areas, which is, I guess, a, a tactful way of, of me putting it. So over to you. Um, let me maybe start with um, a little anecdote. In uh, 2020, uh, the Commission consulted on the um, Democracy Action Plan. Uh, so it was a public consultation and we thought we were going to respond to make it clear that there is a big uh, connection between protecting consumers, protecting citizens, for example, in relation to data protection, consumers in relation to data protection, to consumer law, whatever. Uh, and protecting democracies, because what we see, uh, the tracking and profiling, the exploitation of the data, it all leads to screwing up uh, information uh, and fails information uh, and uh, the way that people are targeted. It's 
all related, and we wanted the European Commission to acknowledge that in their action plan, but I think we haven't come very far, but I think it would be necessary to do that, and I think it's really civil society who has that uh, task uh, to do it. But the other point, and I'm deviating a little bit from the politically sensitive areas because I don't know exactly what we mean by that uh, if we talk about um, uh, manipulating elections, manipulating people, I think it, it, it burns down to the same, it boils down to the same uh, problem. But what I think is really the task of civil society, particularly in 2024, is to draw attention to the problem we have with enforcement and the resources of public authorities, but also the resources of civil society to do enforcement and to do compliance check. Uh, because though, Wojciech, you said you don't really like so much the, um, the focus on enforcement, I, I think, I mean, we have had the experience with the GDPR, uh, and, and we know that enforcement is necessary in order to be credible. And we need our institutions to be credible, because there is a real threat, and we will see it with the next European elections, of this uh, sliding into, you know, uh, a lot of support for uh, right-wing parties and orientations. And I think it's very important to make sure that everybody understands our institutions are credible. Uh, the Brussels effect and Europeans' regulation is credible. It does work in practice. So there, there is a lot to do. And the discussion about implementation, enforcement, compliance is hugely important. If you look at the AI Act, which unfortunately, in our opinion, has been based on a product uh, legislation framework, which means there is going to be conformity assessments in order to be um, in line with the requirements of the Act. Conformity assessments are going to be mainly self-assessments by the industry. So who is going to look after that? Who is going to watch that? I don't think for the time being the authorities that have been designed now in the AI Act, I mean I haven't really studied it yet, but we will see, it's market surveillance authority, no idea how they're going to cope with it. And civil society, I mean, we have seen Neub was just amazing in drawing attention to the GDPR and how it could deliver, but we need to do that, and we need to do it also in other areas. So that, that's my main point here. Thank you. Thank you, and yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the AI Act. Um, along with colleagues, we've been studying it in, in a lot of depth um, in the last few days, weeks, months, years. Um, and something we've noticed as well is, is this kind of lack of, of thinking through some of the parts around, around the market surveillance, as we call it, and, and how it's going to be enforced. And one example that stands out to me is on some of the biometric surveillance uses, um, particularly retrospective facial recognition. Um, it's going to be, it's going to have an authorization process um, by a judicial authority or an administrative authority. Um, administrative agency and what we see there is that it's missing the word independent so whilst I think all of us have in common you know a, a, a real respect for and, and appreciation of the need for the independence of these oversight mechanisms um, what we see there actually in this case of retrospective facial recognition by police is that a police administrative authority could probably act as the authorizing entity under how this uh, final AI Act has been drafted. And so really it's, it's the police rubber stamping the police, um, which really does worry us. Um, so I'm going to move us on now to a bit of a wild card question that I didn't put in the session prep. But um, based on what you said, I'm really curious to know really what anyone's thoughts might be. So you mentioned the democracy action plan and the fact that you wanted the commission in, in what they put forward to be more attuned to the enforcement and implementation questions. Broadly, where do we as panelists think that this lack of, of attention to enforcement and implementation is coming from? Is it the drafts that we receive from the commission? Is it the political climate? Is it something else entirely? Does anyone have any speculation that you could share about what is causing this issue? <laughs> A tough question. Well, I would like to respond. Yes, please. If I may, I would like to actually respond to, maybe it's also an answer to this question, but something you mentioned before. So now the sudden rise of biometric surveillance. Um, and I'm just always thinking like, why are we discussing this? Um, how many thousands of years has, you know, has our species been here without this sort of very intrusive way of treating each other? 
in the context of that in many of our European countries, it has never been so safe as it currently is. In combination with that, I feel that many of us really value the fact that we have democracies, knowing that anonymity is one of the main ingredients of a healthy democracy and has been always like that, which means that it doesn't matter which job you have, you know, even if you're working at the European Commission, you need to be able to actually go to the street, go to this conference, um, open a Twitter account anonymously, share your opinion uh, without living under constant fear that without you knowing it, you have been catched and then there will be huge repercussions. So what I feel in this, in this type of discussion is that very quickly we start to talk about the technique you know, and the implementation of technologies, like how can we do it in a privacy-friendly way, but actually it's the wrong discussion that we should be having as a society. The, the discussion that we should be having is what type of society do we want to have? I mean, we could actually transform into something more authoritarian. That's also part of a democracy. We could actually vote for that, and then, you know, it's also possible, but I feel that while not having this discussion, while not choosing for it, we're actually slowly gathering the building blocks of something that at one day actually could, could turn against us. And the last thing that I wanted to mention is that in my new article that I'm currently writing, I've been studying the interesting fact that the word privacy has been added to the Dutch dictionary in 1950, shortly after the Second World War. Um, and I was reading this super fascinating book where at that time they said, we should never ever anymore build a database with Jewish people. Because that was actually the reason why it was so easy to find the people that were deported and that were murdered. Now, that hasn't been such a long time ago. I'm just wondering, how is it possible? How did we went from not having a list of people that form a group based on their religion to a system that, <laughs> You know, and even voluntarily, and that's why I really believe that consumer protection should be an essential part of this, voluntarily giving up that freedom that we had to not disclose this to anyone. And I feel we should not be talking about the technology so much rather than the societal implications. Thanks, Danny. And it, you remind me of what Wojciech said at the beginning, actually, about how our role is not to legitimize and make harms acceptable. Um, you know, we need to go much further beyond that and, and figure out exactly as you're saying what we can accept in society and what not. Um, I'm going to go back now to Simona. Um, in your work you've kind of witnessed lawmaking in a lot of politically sensitive contexts. Um, so I want to ask what your predictions are for the next mandate you know, when it comes to privacy, data protection, the rule of law. Are you, are you hopeful? Are you pessimistic? What do you see on the horizon? Well, uh, as has already come back a couple of times this discussion with the polls of this morning, uh, my first outlook is quite pessimistic about uh, the future of data protection and especially the rule of law. But also it makes me quite fiery to fight back even more because I think for a lot of people, and I'm sure we'll go into that later as well, privacy is quite an abstract concept. Uh, and that's also why uh, voluntarily people say, oh, I don't have anything to hide. I don't care if uh, Facebook uh, registers whatever data about me that I'm not even quite sure of what they're collecting because it's such an abstract concept for so many people. And what you see all over the place from in the US when uh, the right to abortion uh, was put under pressure, suddenly it became really clear what the implications are of apps constantly tracking your menstrual cycle and your pregnancy chances. Uh, you see it in even in my own country in the Netherlands now, the sudden win of the far right, which was really disastrous, I feel, has really woken people up and suddenly uh, people care again about the rule of law and the constitution, while well before those were really abstract concepts to people. So I think, especially because privacy is never like a goal in itself to many people, but it can be really a tool, it can really be a tool for further oppression, to further strengthen power asymmetries. Someone who knows everything about you can also use that against you, either by oppressing you or manipulating you. I think the more the general rule of law is under pressure, 
the more we see tr conservative and far-right and extremist movements rise, I think the more concrete and more important privacy becomes to people. And I hope we can really continue this fight, whatever happens uh, in the next years. Absolutely. Okay, moving then back to the EDPS perspective, Thomas, I want to ask you what you think is still needed to enhance the enforcement of existing privacy and data protection rules that we have. You know, what is missing most obviously for you? Thanks, Ella. I think <clears throat> it became clear that enforcement as such is not the end game. It's not the only objective. Um, it's about preserving our digital identities, preserving um, our values. And that's why we as the EDPS, we are in the same line as the other data protection supervisor authorities, those in the European Data Protection Board. Um, we would like to see very quickly the rapid adoption of the rules on the GDPR, on the harmonizing of the administrative rules. Because that promise, and that makes me slightly optimistic, that promises to give um, more clarity for complainants, for example, and for us supervisory authorities as well. And that can only be good. By the way, no such mechanism exists or has even been proposed for issues falling under the law enforcement directive, po police and judicial cooperation and uh, criminal authorities, where as a supervisory authority, we actually have exactly the same needs to um, handle complaints and deal with uh, cross-border issues. But if we see that happening, rapid adoption of the GDPR rules harmonization, that means more cross-border cases, more work for the European Data Protection Board, more dispute resolution, probably also more litigation. We see that very clearly. And then it all boils down to resources. I think it's pretty clear that all independent supervisory authorities already struggle today with the correct amount of resources. Um, and we don't see, I don't see any additional resources happening. Not this year, not next year. So um, that's a question. Um, compare this to the commission, which has just put out a vacancy notice for 50 more staff for um, enforcing the Digital Services Act. So of course we can do our part by working much better together at European level with our counterparts in the uh, supervisory authorities, but that will only take us so far. So some mixed messages there. Sure, so I guess it's about the, the broader enforcement ecosystem. Um, would anyone else have other things for a wish list for, for things you would like to see? Yeah. Thank you. No, I, I just was triggered by, by what you said about implications, and I'm, I'm going to say something which is maybe not very popular in, in this community, but when I uh, started, so to speak, to work on privacy data protection, I was always like, why do they always talk about advertising? I mean, we're still always talking about business models for behavioral advertising that we have to fight them. I, I think it's really time to go much further beyond. We should talk about personal pricing, a huge topic which we will see more and more, which has huge implications, exclusion of people, uh, more profiling in very sensitive fields. We should talk about access to services. We should talk about you know what offers you see on the internet. Um, so I, I think I would like the wish list is to expand really this discussion and look at business models in a more global, not only related to advertising. And that's also what people think. I mean, what, you know, this advertising there doesn't really harm. But I think we all need to understand the, the real implications. Uh, and then just a quick back to your question on what is the reason why don't we talk enough about enforcement or why is it not sexy, etc. I think enforcement has always been difficult in terms of just the legal competences of the European Union compared to the member states and the member states are the ones who are in charge of enforcement. But we've seen a lot of changes recently. I mean, who would have thought that the DMA would be possible? Who would have thought that the DSA, that the Commission is the exclusive enforcer for the very large online platforms and the very large uh, search engines? I mean, I think Five years ago, everybody would have said, never ever, this is going to happen. But what I want to say is we have 30 years of single market. 
but we have a totally outdated understanding of how compliance and enforcement structures should work. And I think this is also very much something that we would like to put forward. And the EDPS has been, again, showing the way with the conference last year about enforcement in the digital world. But I think we need to expand that and, and go much further. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, did you want to add something? Yeah, so I, I, I really like the topic of systems because I feel that in the end, if you want to make it a large shift in society, you need to sh change the systems rather than trying to work better in them. And one thing that I found very interesting in, in my research when, when I see that the amount of privacy and data protection infringements are accumulating, and it's, it became impossible to know who is processing your data and for which purposes. And then I started thinking like, couldn't we turn it around? Right now, personal data are plain text letters, and you know that they belong to you because you gave it to them or you're maybe identifiable because of them, but couldn't we add a cryptographic layer when sharing the personal data that we have or force large companies to add it so that in a privacy-friendly way, obviously, these data would actually pop up in your system so that you would have some sort of dashboard, maybe a device, maybe it's embedded in your browser, where you could always oversee all personal data that is out there that is connected to you in the world, and that you could actually exercise your rights with the press of a button. Because I've been feeling now like I'm, I, after I was tweeting about this, um, this, this European regulation, I also uh, got shadow banned by Twitter and, and by X. I did an access request, and I didn't get access to, to, to which decision they made about me automated with which algorithm, uh, how it worked, and specifically which content led to this shadow banning. I need to go to court now in April. Um, they sent four lawyers to me. Um, I figured out that actually it was a quotation of a professor uh, in the Netherlands that, um, that triggered the ban, but I, mean, I just wanted to share that I, I feel that if we really want to resolve this, we should not only think about tuning the current system, but I feel we need to come up with, with a more up-to-date system that empowers individuals to actually exercise the rights that they have. Yeah, love the idea of, of changing the system, and, and definitely that's an example of where we need to be better empowered as human beings. I wonder if anyone else has reflections on that idea that you'd like to share. Yeah, Simona, please. Yes, I think, I think there are some very interesting ideas that are on really fundamentally changing the system. But I think also part of the existing system is that we do also, and I know it's not that green to usually say, but we do also have a lot of solid rules out there that the current system is that many, especially companies, but also governments, just do not follow. They simply don't and they'll make up another legal form with the reasons why they can process all your data and follow you around constantly. And then if uh, a privacy authority says something about that, then they'll find another legal basis and drag it all the way to courts. And I think here also enforcement could be part of that system change, and maybe we could also system change enforcement. And I know there's a lot of really good work going on, and I also really respect the work of the EDPS, but an idea that's been floating around in the parliament and that I've seen coming back multiple times is, for example, especially as centralized enforcement and the need thereof is increasingly growing, uh, more centralized enforcement of digital laws, as we have quite a pack now for very large companies, especially, because um, in these times where we see that a very small number of very large companies completely does not care about any rules and uh, just puts, pumps money into sending you 10 lawyers, uh, threatening constantly to drag people, NGO, civil society to court, um, we need to counterbalance that. And I think we can only do that by bundling resources, bundling expertise, bundling the brilliant minds we have working on these topics. And I think for the future, if we're talking about wish lists and ways to change things, some form of further centralization of enforcement of all the digital laws we've just passed would be useful. 
Thank you for that. And I think it's very telling, actually, if you compare you know, the struggle of the Commission to hire their extra 15 DSA enforcers compared to Twitter, who can just send four lawyers for a shadow banning case. There's a, a real asymmetry of resources of power there. Um, so we've touched on a couple of times some of the laws that we have on the horizon that will have opportunities, but maybe also challenges for data protection and privacy and broader human rights enforcement and, um, and that are going to go through the implementation in the coming months and years. So we have things like the Digital Services Act, the Artificial Intelligence Act. So I want to ask the, the panelists what sort of opportunities and or challenges they do foresee as we're going to start seeing these new pieces of law ramp up. Um, so maybe Danny, if you could go first. So I'm actually quite positive about at least the DSA, because again, it empowers individuals if it works. Now, in my case, I didn't get a notice that Twitter should actually send to me, but um, in theory, if they would have sent me the notice that I got shadow banned, I would have known because of this message, I could have been appealing it. So I like these type of laws because they actually empower people. Um, I, at the same time, feel that while all these, I would say, infringement-based laws and tests I mean, we shadow banned this message because of this reason. It's, it's, it's certainly important, but at the same time, I, I start to feel that we are actually looking at the wrong way. Because while we are looking at all these infringement-based laws, we actually miss the point that, that the, the sole goal of all these laws is to actually protect the human being and to create a space that actually consist of the essence of what we tried to once protect. Um, and that's actually why I know some of you are researchers in academia. And I really want to ask people to dive more into the world of the fundamental right to human dignity, which is Article 1 of the EU Charter. And which actually, if you study it, that's what I'm doing in my dissertation. I hope to soon release it to you so you can comment on it. But hopefully it might bring us a little bit further because what I see is that human dignity is not about the infringement from a commercial company or all the infringements that the EU Commission would like to en embed in law, but it's about the very simple question, if at the end of the day, people that are part of our society still can enjoy enough of the essence of the fundamental rights that we try to protect. And we can unload even tens of more laws, but if we just look at, you know, we go on the streets here, you go with a train, you want to communicate, you make a reservation in a restaurant, I don't see really much of the essence of privacy anymore in the society that we created, and that's not because of one single individual isolatable infringement that is caused by any party, but it's because of the collective of what we as a society are doing, and I'm very positive that I feel that the fundamental right to human dignity could actually protect us against that because it's also a positive obligation for lawmakers to actually come up with solutions. And I feel that one of the things that could come out of that is that large companies, but also our government, should not only check the proportionality of individual infringements that they create for a specific reason, but also the collective, the aggregate intrusion taken together that they uh, take on our everyday fundamental rights. And if you need to weigh that as well, you would actually put them in the position to create a little bit more trade-offs. Do you want to scan private digital communications or do you want to enroll other types of surveillance rather than doing it all? Because it's just the interference that you actually need to test and once you get it done, you can just roll another one out. I think this idea as well of, of being creative about how we can enforce our rights is, is something that I heard in, in what Simona was sharing and from Ursula as well. So maybe that's one of, one of the themes that we're, we're really pulling out is how we need to think laterally and in slightly different ways if we're going to be able to shift these systems that we know we very much need to shift. Going back then more onto the, the DSA, the AI Act, or the other laws that we have coming up into the their rollout phase. Um, Ursula, what would you see as some of the big challenges and or opportunities that, that these new governance mechanisms are going to create for us? Yeah, thank you. I mean, maybe just trying to connect also to what we just discussed um, about the empower 
empowerment of individuals, which, which I think is, is really important. But I also have to say I'm a bit skeptical about the average person, the average consumer, the average human being having the time, the resources, the knowledge, the energy to go after their, their rights really in a way that is necessary. As you also described, you make an access request, you don't get an answer. I mean, who has time to then go after everything again? I personally very much believe in a collective interest representation, and this is why I've been working for consumer and digital rights protection for such a long time. I think civil society in representing these interests and also doing enforcement collectively, that is fundamentally important. So, um, of course, protection by design is also something which we have there, we have it in the GDPR, and, and actually we're trying to translate that now into consumer law, because people don't have time to think and to take informed decisions, it's just not possible in such a complex world. We need protection by design and by default, and the GDPR has it and shows it, but it's not enforced. So, I mean, these are just two points. But in relation to the enforcement and the resources, and, and that, I mean, of course, authorities, public authorities, that cannot really cater for everything. Apart from working hand in hand with authorities for civil society, I think we also have now opportunities to come in at the lower level, talking about impact assessments, impact assessments under the DSA, for example, that the very large online platforms have to do, looking at impact on fundamental rights. So how is this going to work out? Because if, if I'm a, a business, I see, okay, impact assessment on fundamental rights, on privacy, on mm, dignity, very important. I mean, what do I do there? And who knows what I'm going to do? And what, what is the standard? What, what is the, the good governance for an impact assessment? So these are all open questions, and I think we really have a role to play there. Um, the other uh, element that I really see and it's not very sexy neither, and I'm afraid we're having a lot of technical things here, it's standardization. We know that in the AI Act, this is going to play a huge role because the first level law, so the AI Act itself, it gives a lot of discretion to the standardization bodies. To a degree, I don't know what the final wording is going to be, but if we talk about data management to avoid discrimination, the law only says something like, should be done in a way that it does not infringe anti-discrimination law, and then that goes to the standardization body, and you know the standardization bodies are dominated by industry, and it's basically a business model, a private business model. So making that more inclusive, having civil society, uh, having a say there, and following now in the mandate that the standardization sense and LEC will have, I think it's going to be really important, and for the future, I think we shouldn't have certain things in standardization that should be regulated in a democratic way by the democratically elected institutions and not by private standardization. I mean, this is a big topic. I'm going to step um, out of that here, but it, I think we have more opportunities at the lower level before it comes to these business practices being rolled out. That's where we also have to put the foot in and to make sure that it doesn't happen and have uh, a say. And then, I mean, we were lobbying a lot for having complaints procedure, having collective redress possible in the DSA, in the DMA, in the AI Act, in the Data Act, in the Data Governance Act. To a big degree, I think we have it there. You have individual complaints procedures, you have collective complaint procedures, you have collective redress in all of these laws, but we have to use it. So that's the challenge, and we will need also the resources to do so. Thank you. Thanks, and you've just listed you know, really a slew of different laws that are relevant for digital rights and, and that are you know, really quite overwhelming, um, as well as offering a lot of possibilities. So maybe, Thomas, from your perspective, how do you anticipate that the work of the EDPS and maybe of the supervisory authorities nationally, how is that going to change? How does it need to change? How can it change in light of, of all these big legislative changes that we're seeing? Well, first, we have to make sense and understand what's happening there, and I think that's our main job. Um, but let me just uh, a side note to the issue of dignity. I think that's an interesting case because, as you all know, in Germany in 1983, the first judgment from the German Federal Constitutional Court creating the right to informational self-determination was actually what we now call privacy and data protection was actually de derived from the right to dignity. And this is um, uh, so I think 
this is indeed underpinning the work we do, and if it's not clear still, then it's probably our job to explain it yet uh, once more to everybody who's willing to listen. But Ella, you were referring to the changes um, for the EDPS in our work because of all this tsunami of digital legislation, which, by the way, I also think it's great that we have these now because I think we've been waking up in Europe. We have been looking at what technology does to us in our digital lives. And now you see a sort of reaction to something's going on, but we in Europe would like to change it to a way which is more in conformity with our values and our way of life. That's why we have the GDPR. That's why we have now these other um, legal acts. And as for the EDPS, certainly there will be a big change already preparing this year, but coming with the AI Act, because suddenly we'll be finding ourselves not just as a data protection supervisory authority, but as the supervisory authority for uh, the EU institutions, offices, bodies, and agencies when it comes to AI, uh, for the AI Act. So that means that. That means we are also a market surveillance authority, a notifying authority, things which we as an institution haven't done so far. So we're looking into this. And of course, the normal tasks of a supervisory authority, person data protection, doesn't go away. On the contrary, we will have more, you mentioned already, Frontex, Europol, there are new legislation on the um, uh, asylum and migration package. There is a directive on new EU police information exchange, facial recognition. So there is going to be a lot of more data flowing around and our job will have to be to look at this and scrutinize it together with um, civil society, obviously, and other associations. Um, so that is going to be massive and we're preparing for that. Um, but maybe it'll also be an opportunity to look at, again, under one, in one house, to look at all these aspects um, under one guidance, um, sort of a centralized approach for EU institutions. But it's work in progress. So uh, maybe we'll see a lot of uh, job board <laughs> notifications coming up then, hopefully, to, to be able to, to bolster that work. Um, so we're reaching the final 15 minutes or so of this panel. Um, so I'd like to take a moment to open it up for any audience questions. Um, we've had you know, quite a, a roller coaster going through this tsunami of digital legislation, and we've covered a lot of different things from digital rights and human rights through to the punitive political context in which we're sitting. Um, so from the audience, what would you, is there anything you would like to know from our panelists about these topics? Fantastic. We've got a question over there, please. First of all, thank you very much for this fantastic panel. Um, I would like to make a remark more than a question here uh, related to the system that Danny proposed. Uh, this uh, idea was basically to swap uh, the current system into a new system where people are aware uh, at all the time of the type of data that is uh, um, being processed. And uh, my first, uh, the first thought that I had is that some people don't even know what a cookie is. And I was also thinking that why not focusing in the technological literacy of people as a means to maybe uh, hopefully reduce the need for enforcement. So I would like to ask if you have considered this approach um, within, because you are authorities, so I don't know, I, I have the feeling that um, the technological literacy of people is not being um, pushed and back up and we are having these very high level discussions, but the, not everyone, not every citizen is aware of uh, these complex concepts. And also they don't have um, the need to keep track of these new technologies and also the impact in their lives. So I would like to know what is, um, if you have considered this 
uh, as an approach? And what do you think about this? Thank you for the question. So it's how or whether improving digital literacy could even be a pre-step to help us you know, upstream to not even need to be doing so much enforcement. So who would like to respond to that? We should somehow start saying that this is the role that we try to play uh, when we advise uh, the legislator uh, from the commission that prepares the, the draft uh, law uh, to the parliament and the council. But of course, this is only advice. So that means that it don't need to be followed by the uh, parliament and the council in their work. And then we go to the problem of how to, how to deal with the effects uh, uh, that we get uh, from the legislator. Uh, the second part is what uh, uh, Ursula was talking about, uh, the different uh, solutions by default uh, and by design that are created. They allow the citizen, who, the person who has uh, no, not enough knowledge to, to understand the, per, the process uh, to be uh, also uh, covered by the, uh, by, by the protection. But actually what is uh, probably the most important uh, is uh, the, this enforcement part anyway. I, I'd like to say that uh, I don't want to be misunderstood that we, are not, uh, uh, that we are not believing in enforcement. For us enforcement is the most important part of the story. But the enforcement which is not counted in the fines, which is not counted in the big cases, but is found, counted in the possibility to, uh, to uh, save this person who is an average user. And here, the help of the organizations like BOG are, uh, is uh, uh, the, the clue. I mean, I, I already uh, alluded to it, but I think, I mean, digital literacy is, of course, very important, but it's only a parallel kind of itinerary. We, we have to also go the other way because, uh, as said, I mean, people cannot, I don't think people can protect themselves. The average person in this complex environment, and it will not get better with AI-powered services and products and what you have, that people are able to do that, and we should not expect to the, I mean, it's not the society I would anticipate or it would be on the wish list that people have to spend hours and hours. Uh, I think we, we, have to, we have to do it differently. We have one, um, our members, some of our members have a complaint pending against uh, Google, for example, in Ireland in front of the DPC, uh, which we called the name of the action was um, Fast Track to Surveillance. It's about what choices do you get when you open a Google account and I can tell you, I mean, we have studied that in detail. Uh, and you need much more time. And it's basically impossible to understand how you find your way to a really more privacy-friendly way to, to interact with, with Google and, and the consequences of setting up an account. So it's, it's just something that we have to do differently. And it's not us, but companies have to do it in compliance with the law so that people can trust that by design, they have a choice, which means a choice that is compliant with the law, with the fundamental rights. I think that that's what you know, we want to achieve. And education is, is very important, of course, and it's very helpful, but it will not be enough. No, just to hop on those two thoughts, if you, a fantastic question, and I think we, we absolutely need this, but... Um, if you compare this to the real world, in the real world, when you open your tap in the kitchen, you usually would expect that drinkable water comes out of that. You don't have to sit down and do a chemical analysis if it's safe to drink. You don't have to do similar things. And I don't think we are there yet in the digital world, but we should be there. That's why the GDPR, for example, has data protection by design and by default as a legal obligation, so that precisely you don't have to think, okay, what happens if I open an account with X company, will I be surveyed for the rest of my life, yes or no? That's the idea. So, indeed, that's where the enforcement comes in um, that to make this happen, because otherwise you will just teach your children or everybody how to uh, learn certain business models which are probably uh, 
unlawful and are not in compliance with the law. So, of course, digital literacy to understand that there is a certain way, but better to get things right from the beginning so that you don't even have to think about it because who has time to think and reflect, okay, this vendor should get my cookie and the other one shouldn't. We don't have time for that. I also think it's a great question. <clears throat> I actually wrote an article about this two weeks ago. Um, and what I found was quite shocking is that in order to become digital literate, you need to be able to read and write. And unfortunately, in many countries in Europe, we see the, the levels going down. The Netherlands was one of the top performers, and we are now at the second last place um, uh, in the PISA research. Um, and this is a bigger problem than digital literacy. Um, you need digital literacy, but if you can read and write, you could actually learn how to do some things and start reading about it at a certain point in your life. But without being able to read and write, you are not able to, to develop those digital skills. And we see that people with a low lit regular literacy, they live shorter, they become more unhealthy, they have lower incomes. So I feel that, yes, you're totally right, but in order to have digital literate people, we should first focus on the basics. I won't bore you too much longer, but I think uh, what could also be very interesting there is enforcement to path away to create that digital privacy by design and the development further of guidelines, which are always really useful. And of course, we have uh, what could interact nicely is the upcoming review of consumer law, where you have this concept in consumer law, which is the diligent provider, or there's a kind of a standard of due diligence of what any trader should in any case do. And I think, for example, the parliament just passed a report on addictive design of online services to make non-addictive design of online services the standard within that whole concept of the diligent provider. Um, I think these kind of concepts and imp implementing them broadly uh, as the standard would be useful and we need to find ways to do it because I think along this whole panel and probably across the whole audience, everybody agrees the current system needs to change and we don't have the time to click through another 20 things and think about where our cookies and data are going. Okay, I think we have time for one more quick question. Okay, sorry, there was a hand up very quickly there. <laughs> I have a question concerning the upcoming review of the GDPR. Any anticipation on uh, in this topic? Uh, do you expect that the European audience, the consultation will bring a lot of changes in the, in the area of enforcement? Well, the answer depends on what you uh, mean by review, because there are two processes which are going on at the moment. One is uh, this uh, changes in the administrative procedure, which are already uh, proceeded in the uh, Parliament and in, in the Council, and uh, where, the, where we have the proposal, where we have the discussion, where we have the consultations as well. But the second thing is the review of the GDPR, which is the normal process uh, foreseen by the regulation, and which shall lead to the more uh, in-depth uh, uh, change, probably, or, uh, or, or at least analyze uh, of how GDPR works. And this process is another process, and that's the process which will be uh, somehow uh, f finalized in 2024. But I guess it will have the results uh, in the possible changes in, uh, uh, starting from 2025. So we have to remember that for this discussion, the precondition are the elections of the European Parliament and the new Parliament we will have, the new Commission we will have, and also the new presidencies that are uh, leading the Council and proposing the priorities. Uh, in this sense, my small, uh, my small good hope for the future is that one of these presidencies will be by my country of origin, where the person who is uh, the Minister of Justice right now responsible for the rule of law is the former uh, NGO activist uh, from the Helsinki Foundation. 
So that might uh, help somehow to pass the messages to the future uh, uh, council. But uh, we have to remember that first of all, we will go to vote in half of next year, uh, sorry, half of this year, and that's the main precondition for any other discussion. But having said this, because precisely there is a public consultation going on, that should be um, of interest to anyone here in the room to make their voice heard. There is uh, simply um, go out there, say what you want to say on that, and then the commission will collect that and draw the consequences, hopefully, and we will see what then happens in 2025. But at least the possibility is there to, uh, to say what you think should be done. Okay, we're going to run out of time very shortly. Um, so before I release you for tea and coffee, um, I'm going to pass back to Wojciech to ask if you could give us some closing reflections on what we've heard in the last hour and a bit. Well, I guess the, the, the first and the most important uh, reflection is that we have to discuss and we have to exchange uh, the observations, the knowledge and the practice uh, uh, between the uh, civil society no matter if we think about the uh, uh, NGOs like NOIP uh, that are involved in the very, uh, precise, very precise in GDPR activity, or those who are dealing with, uh, uh, with it uh, uh, on an uh, everyday basis, uh, or the more uh, broadly understood, uh, the society of the people dealing with uh, human rights. So uh, I only can say the, the data protection authorities uh, are generally open for this, this kind of the discussion with the full understanding that being allies, uh, we have different points of views, also among the NGOs, also among the civic society. And uh, we are there to represent all the people whom we meet at the, uh, as the representatives uh, of, the, uh, so of the citizens. Uh, I can tell that I still believe that the society, civic society uh, is the eyes of the regulators, the eyes of the watchdogs, uh, however we will uh, define them. And uh, there are more people from the EDPS office here today with me uh, to listen, to discuss, to talk with you, and uh, to give you the possibility to have uh, the impact uh, on how the main watchdog uh, on the, uh, in the European Union institutions work. Thank you very much. So with that, I would like to wrap up this panel and say, of course, an enormous thank you to the European Data Protection Supervisor. Thank you, Wojciech. Thank you, Thomas, and all your colleagues. <laughs> And of course, thank you so much, Simona, thank you, Danny, and thank you, Ursula, as well. Have a great afternoon, everyone. <laughs>